Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library. Tonight, our featured author, Patrice Cullers, will discuss her new book, An Abolitionist Handbook, 12 Steps to Change Yourself and the World. We'll meet Patrice and tonight's moderator, Lamerchi Frazier, in just a moment. First, a little bit about tonight's program. We're in a Zoom webinar space, so your microphones and cameras are muted. We do wanna hear from you though, so please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the program, and we will have time toward the end to get to some of the questions that you ask us. And thank you to those of you who've already sent in questions and comments. Closed captioning or subtitles can also be turned on or off via the live transcript button with the little CC also at the bottom of your screen. A recording of tonight's program will be available in the coming weeks on both the Museum of African American History's website and the Boston Public Library's website. To buy a copy of tonight's featured book, please visit our bookstore partner, Trident Booksellers. Information will be put in the chat at a few points during the program, and they will ship nationwide with free media mail shipping, or check your local independent bookstore or local library. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Lamerchi Frazier. Lamerchi is a visual artist and activist, historian and educator who is the Director of Education and Interpretation at the Museum of African American History, Boston and Nantucket. She is engaged in highlighting and curating the museum's collections and exhibits, providing place-based education and interdisciplinary history, pedagogy and programs, projects and lectures. She is a Brother Thomas Fellow, Massachusetts Histor Historical Society Ambassador Fellow, and Colonial Society member. She has had global residencies and her work centering on social justice resides in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian, the White House, Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the Museum of Art and Design. Thank you, Lamerti, and welcome. Thank Stay you sure. so much, Kristen. Uh, I just like to say that it is our delight at the Museum of African American History to join with the Boston Public Library and bringing our phenomenal guest this evening, who is an author, who is an, uh, an abolitionist, as she says, I am an abolitionist. And with that, I'd like to say that Patrice Cullors is a New York Times bestselling author. She's an educator, an ardent storyteller, an artist and an abolitionist from Los, Los Angeles, California. Uh, she has been on the front lines of abolitionist organizing for 20 years since she is uh, in, in that cauldron of organizing and movements. She has reached uh, the point where she is one of the 100 names from Time magazines that are most influential people in two, 2020. Patrice has led multiple Los Angeles-based organizations such as Dignity and Power Now, Justice LA, and Reform LA Jails. In 2020, Patrice signed uh, an overall production deal with Warner Brothers where she intends to continue to uplift Black stories, talent, and creators that will continue to transform the world of art and culture. I would just like to say and reiterate that her, her quote is that I am an abolitionist mm -hmm. and, and it would be our joy to hear you read a brief section of your book, Patrice, and welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Lamerchi. Thank you to the host. I am so grateful to be here and thank you to the 148 participants who are here virtually tonight. While I wish we were in person, I am so glad that we get to uh, still gather safely uh, and just praying to everybody who has suffered any sort of loss during these last few years of this pandemic. I know it's been a very challenging time um, and my hope and my prayer is that abolition can be um, a solve um, and a balm for many of us as we try to chart a new world. Um, and this is from chapter three or step three, nothing is fixed. 
quote, you act, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. Angela Davis, February 13th, 2004, Van Nuys and, and Van Nuys, Los Angeles, California. I had always been a rule breaker, an experimenter, a challenger of normative structures, even before I was sure about coming out as queer. I inherently knew my way of being wasn't wrong. Still, it was difficult to not feel shame for who I was. When I began working inside of movement spaces, I craved a space that would see my differences as an asset rather than a liability. When I became an organizer with the Bus Riders Union, an organization much like New York Strap Hangers campaign that represents public transportation users, I entered into a world where my way of being wasn't an isolated consequence of quote, bad choices. I had made my first interaction with the organizers in training at the Bus, Ride, Bus Riders Union was when I was being recruited by them. I was 18 years old and two organizers came to speak to my youth leadership cohort. Both of them were young and dynamic. When they spoke, they spoke with a conviction that made me want to show up wherever they were. There was confidence, an electric sense of being that I felt lay dormant inside of me, but was on its way to blooming. They played the packed room a 20 minute short that highlighted the work of mainly women of color who were organizing and fighting back against the Los Angeles County transit system. The, the video showed badass women of color who were willing to take on a billion dollar agency. Most importantly, all of the women who were clearly charting a path away from social norms. I remember whispering to, to myself, I wanna be like them when I grow up. Even the unofficial model I heard sp sparked me, 1,000 more buses, 1,000 less police. It was audacious and brave. And the moment I thought about how much that would change for people who depend on the transit system, it seemed like, well, of course, this should happen. Why should black and brown people, mostly low income, have to deal with overcrowded buses, difficult routes to employment and medical sites, poor schedules and high rates while white customers, smaller in number, had larger and more organized systems in their areas? I joined the Bus Riders Union, spent over 10 years in several different positions inside the organization. One thing I learned from the Bus Riders Union is that the only way to fight back in a city and county uh, the only way to fight back in a city and county that is ruled by money is by experimenting and recognizing that nothing, and I mean nothing, is fixed. All right. Thank you so much for that. As uh, we reflect on what you have read, it comes to mind that there were influences in your life that were these giant women women that like Ida B. Wells and Angela Davis and uh, Anisha Sinta and others that are more contemporary today with us as social activists, but that there is this continuum of women that have been a part of your influence. Can you speak to uh, some of what that means to you in elevating your platform and in this continuum of social justice, the things that we might learn and, um, and, and glean from women like you who joins with those women. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I speak a lot about women, powerful Black women and brown women um, in this book, but also in my life who have really charted um, uh, a way of being inside of a really um, sexist, patriarchal, heteronormative place. Um, it's, the, it's the women who, like Audre Lorde or Bell Hooks, in particular, Ella, Ella Baker, these are the women that have helped shape who I am, help understand who I am um, and why I do the work that they do. It's also uh, their work that was often criticized um, while they were changing the very uh, makeup of our uh, cities, counties, states, and country they were often the most criticized, even more than their male counterparts. Uh, and so I really sit with that as well, as I, as I read about these women who were often larger than life, were often the mentors to the, to the men, the civil rights men that we love, like MLK or Malcolm X, it was often women who are mentoring them, helping shape them. Um, and so uh, I, really, I really look to them as I, as I helped write this book. Um, 
and obviously I, I would, you know, I need to make it very clear that the woman that was on my mind the most as I wrote this book and as I've been doing this work for 20 years was Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that was in, in some of the description of what uh, you uh, attribute to your development. And interestingly, um, I wanted to understand more about why you chose the term abolitionist and this, this cauldron of abolition uh, to describe the moment now. We know that there was an 18th and 19th century abolitionist community that yeah. was impacted by uh, slavery and, uh, and their refusal to accept it and to uh, abolish slavery in this country. And that continuum now becoming a, a renaissance in the, uh, the, uh, the examination of abolition and the word abolition itself. So I'd just like to ask you if you could define for us sure. what you mean by abolition. Yes, um, the word and term abolition is fairly simple. Um, it is in this current context, the abolition of prisons, police, jails, court surveillance and detention center as we know it. It's the abolition of the criminal legal system as we know it. And uh, and then I'll take it a step further, because abolition is really also about how we treat each other. It's about how we take care of each other. Uh, it's about moving away from uh, what we have truly been indoctrinated with, which is um, treating people um, uh, as it was just really relying on vengeance and punishment as a way to relate to human beings. Um, I'm really calling for us to challenge the carceral culture that we've um, digested. And we need to start building towards a, a culture of care, uh, a culture of healing, um, transformation. That's the kind of abolitionist movement that I am so dedicated to. Okay, so as you sit at these intersections of activism, organizing, transformation, healing, repair, and as you have brought to us just in your definition, this idea of change, yes. a change toward a future that is not um, bound by the, the, the practices that we have had heretofore, right. nor a narrative that's been here before. Um, in your 12 steps to changing yourself and the world, an abolitionist handbook, and what really struck me about that, that your, your reach is not just local or national, it is a global reach. Mm -hmm. and, and you put it in that context. Um, can you tell us more about this idea of looking to a future that you, you quote some in your, in your book, you quote others, who lead the text of each chapter that I thought was uh, brilliant in, it, in, that stretch, in that stroke of bringing us into some words that have been spoken before, but how you use it. And in your uh, uh, chapter four, uh, say yes to imagination. As a creative, I'm really drawn <laughs> to that. <laughs> but, but more so to look at how you use the 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 quote about science fiction from Adrian Brown yeah. to uh, ignite our thinking with respect to what imagination brings us as a um, as a hook or core to our thinking critically in this uh, in abolition. I believe that um, our imagination is actually the central force to help us usher in abolition. We have lived in this place, this country um, that has um, stolen our imagination. Um, I believe white supremacy and patriarchy stills our ability to imagine something different. It's why so often when people, when, when we use the word abolition or we call for abolition, people have a guttural response of fear. It's why it's scary to people. What are we going to do as if 
the current system as we know it has been the only system for millions of years. It's just not true. We've been on this planet for quite some time and there's been different ways that we've dealt with accountability, that we've dealt with harm, different ways that we've dealt with um, the economy, uh, how we relate to each other, how we take care of each other, different systems that have existed over time. What we know right now is this current system, this system was not imagined by us, Black people in particular. Mm -hmm. um, it was imagined by someone else and they, and they put it on us. And so we are, um, we're due for, for um, imagining something different. It doesn't work. Uh, it didn't work before the pandemic. Um, and now we see it even more, how much it doesn't work, this current system. I say it's an economy of punishment. Um, neglect is one of the highest forms of punishment. When you neglect a population from its ability to get health care, uh, when you neglect a population from its ability to have housing, when you neglect a population from its ability to have access to healthy food, that's punishment. And so we have to actually re-enter this conversation and call for an economy of care. How do we resource each other? How do we resource those most vulnerable? And how do we make sure every single human being, how do we make sure every single living being has the care that they deserve? Yes. Okay. So as you uh, talk about that, it appears that we need to be re-educated mm -hmm. or uh, look at what you call experimental education. And, and when you talk about your life in the book, you give us this idea that you, you tried many different ways and approaches to things. And it makes me think about um, Frederick Douglass as he uh, talked about his education when he was asked, what did he as a self-taught man attribute his education to? And he said, it, I, um, I say that I have learned from the Massachusetts School of Abolition. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in looking at the kind of frame with which information can be had That's and right. what we need to impart to our children, yes. the, the portion that you talk about this idea of a self-led curriculum that our children can do. Can you uh, expound on that for us so that we understand more about what may be a possibility of our, our future learning methodology. And as you do that, can you also um, let us know why you call this pedagogy? Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot about how not, I think a lot about not just theory, but practice. And obviously we know that intersection of theory and practice is praxis. Uh, I think a lot about how we um, translate the, the big ideas that so many people have and practice it in real life. Oftentimes, uh, we could read a lot of books. I got a lot of books behind me. Um, but when it comes to practicing those things, it's much more difficult, especially because we don't live in an abolitionist world. Um, so to practice abolition in a place that is not uh, a culture to it, um, is actually antithetical to abolition, can be quite challenging. Um, I really created this book um, to be a practice manual. Um, you know, we all study to take our license tests. We all, you know, you know, some of us study to take the LSATs and the MCATs. This is to study to be an abolitionist and you have to keep going back to it. Um, and, you know, I really identify as an, as, uh, as practicing abolitionist parenting. Um, probably I'm like the last generation of children who were told, you know, um, uh, to be seen but not heard, um, you know, to bind your business, to not talk back, all of those things in which I learned as a, as a parent that actually when your child talks or if they're curious, if they're arguing, that's actually really helpful in developing their skills uh, to be a human being, to be a, um, a, a human being that has power, um, that be a human being that feels empowered. And so part of this, you know, pedagogy, this abolitionist pedagogy is about re unlearning, first of all, unlearning all the things that we've learned, especially as black people, right? Different communities are le learned and taught different ways of being. We're taught to, um, you know, 
not challenge. We're often taught to just keep going, you know, you'll, you'll get yours, you know, take it quietly. Um, and abolition is asking us to unlearn a lot of that and relearn our power um, and what we deserve um, and why, you know, our feelings are important. Um, I don't know how many times I was told, you know, and, and there's no judgment to my parents, I love them, but, you know, suck it up. You know, it's hard out there for everybody. You don't, no need, we ain't doing tears right now. Um, and so really calling for, you know, us to remember that I have a whole chapter on, um, remember how, allow yourself to feel, allow yourself to feel the impact of what has happened and what has, um, yeah, what we've experienced. Because when we allow ourselves to feel, um, we give ourselves more range to understand our needs. And when we understand our needs, we can make demands and we can change conditions if they're not meeting our needs. Um, and that's also a part of abolitionist practice. Well, um, I truly am very grateful for the format that you have chosen for this book. And as I began to like eat up the pages, uh, excuse that expression, but <laughs> it, it was a lot to digest. <laughs> of course, um, you have put out challenges to us, but one of the uh, key uh, components of what you just answered, you said what we deserve. And I remember you quoting um, Toni Morrison who was uh, eulogizing James Baldwin. Yeah. And James Baldwin had said that um, our crown has been bought and paid for. All we have to do is wear it. That's right. And that this defines and illustrates the idea of imagination. Um, uh, I, I thought that that was something that we have not necessarily embraced. Um, but as a, a man who too was raised to this level of writing and authorship that is about the collective consciousness, the collective identity, the collective idea uh, yeah. that you speak to so very well. Um, can you speak to how, when you read that and then you included it in your book, how that made you feel? We wanna know something about how your writing process led you to, uh, to use certain kinds of examples to bring it home. Yeah, I mean, um, some people know this, but um, maybe most people don't. I actually, this book comes from a Harvard Law Review article that I wrote. So, you know, all hell Boston and, and the Harvard, Harvard. Um, they came to me a few years ago asking that I write a piece on abolition. They were, they were dedicating the whole law review to abolition. And uh, I said, yeah, of course. And then I sat for, I think they asked me, you know, a year before and I sat for six months, like, what am I gonna say? You know, there's so much that has been said. But I realized something that I hadn't seen enough, especially in academic settings, is this conversation about abolition in practice. Um, and I had been practicing it for a long time. So I wanted to really build that out in this um, conversation. And so this book comes from that. And you know, through the writing process, uh, and I really wanna shout out my editors, um, you know, St. Martin's Press, uh, and also Aaliyah King, who helped work on this book with me, and Lisette Lasso, who helped me with the bios of each individual, that individual activist that we highlighted. Um, I kept just digging in, you know, I had these 12 steps already, these 12 principles or guidelines, and I just kept thinking, well, what's the salient point here? What do I want to make? How do I show this practice? And then how do I show people other places they can go to continue the practice? And I knew I wanted to highlight people. I knew I wanted to show other people. I wanted to show other, I wanted to highlight the other people in my world that I admire that are also abolitionists. Um, that felt really important as well. Yes. And so uh, with that, when we think about um, here in Boston, particularly, as you mentioned, Boston, we have this beginnings of the revolution, the beginnings and foundation of America, and uh, this, this idea of freedom and democracy being espoused in certain documents that were created, uh, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. And when we view them in terms of uh, 
liberation theory. Yes. And, and the, the theory that you are speaking to right now, there are many who are unsung in this, this effort who began it at the beginning. But as you now have evolved through the intersectionality of how you are treating um, abolition as a culture mm-hmm. and a movement, not just that it is uh, the partaking of uh, resistance, but it is then making new. And so um, unlike many of us who want to look for the inspiration to continue. There has been, especially over the past two years, a kind of hopelessness yeah. that has emerged in people or despair that, you know, the, we're, we're in this, um, this, this double pandemic and to that situation of duality um, as we uh, negotiate the space of it. Mm-hmm. We wanna think of how what you have laid out in this guidebook can help us get through it. Yeah. Um, the, the abolitionists in the 18th and 19th century started this, what becomes this continuum into the 21st. And your book gives us some ideas of how we can tool ourselves as 21st century people. Yes. And so uh, looking at your magnificent format mm-hmm. that you lay out in each chapter, um, that introduction with the quotes and then the, the, the story that you get us into this chapter and what it means in, as one of those 12 steps and the assessment of what I know, what you know, uh, uh, the real world, the, the idea of how to yeah. is what comes to mind. And then you have these guidelines that are guiding questions at the end of each each chapter. I'm telling you people, you have to get this book. It is so well done. Um, But I just wanted to ask within that frame, why you chose that method? Um, And what it, uh, how did you come about laying it out in that way as steps to follow? The 12 steps within themselves is one thing, but then how you uh, lay out and design each chapter with yeah. that same kind of repetitive motion. And then at the end, how you bring to us that these are things that we're gonna have to come back to. We have to come back to those conversations. We have to, to be uh, in a conscious recycling of, of this. Yeah. Um, what, what, what part of the question? I, yeah. The, the question I wanted to know is how, um, as you have laid this out, Yes. Why you laid it out like you did. And then, you know, how can we, in following what you do, um, how can we better understand where you're taking us with this? You know, um, I really wanted folks to feel held as they read the book, Mm -hmm. um, taken care of. I'm, I'm asking a lot of you to read this. I'm asking you to dig in to yourself. It's not just about looking at the system outside of us. It's not just about pointing the finger at something outside of you. Um, I'm I'm asking you and I'm asking myself to step into these principles and these values and these steps. It's, I practice these on a daily basis. (laughs) Um, You know, I was thinking this morning, I had read an article about me uh, because there's a, there's a, a, a tendency right now to, 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 uh, slander my name in the media, but we know that that's what happens to, to folks who are making effective change. And so I wanted, I was like, should I have a courageous conversation with someone who said a quote that I kind of see as a acquaintance? And then I was like, no, that's not, this is not the, this is not the place for a courageous conversation. Then there was another thing. It was like, I wanted to, res- you know, I wanted to react instead of be responsive. And then I was like, Patrice, take the day, take the day. Or, and I asked a question of somebody like, hey, do you think it'd be a good idea? And she was like, probably not a good idea. (laughs) So I am constantly using these values and principles literally every single day. And I want, I wanted folks to feel, um, you know, we have a tendency in this movement now where when people are learning things, 
they get really shamed if they don't know it right away. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a really intense tendency for people to, you know, um, just treat people poorly uh, as we're on our learning journey. And so I'm, I'm hoping this book makes you feel held, uh, lets you know that this is a process um, and that mistakes are important actually. It's how we learn. And if we don't make mistakes, if we don't, or if we're not honest about mistakes made, we can't actually change the mistakes. We can't change what we've, what we've done. And I think we've, because of the, 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 the way social media is curated, it's really curated for contention, um, not for re resolution or transformation. And my hope is that this book can help us learn new ways of being. We've spent almost 15 years now in a social media context. And that social media context for a lot of us uh, we respond like that. You know, I, I read a lot of journalists who are also right, like they're, they're talking on social media versus writing fair and balanced or writing from an objective place. And so, you know, my hope is this kind of um, helps us learn better ways of also being in relationship to each other. And I really want it to, it to give like a lot of resources, like this book is resource heavy so that you feel by the, by the time you finish it, you're probably going to feel, oh God, I got to read that again. Uh, I got to go back to it. Um, oh, wait, let me go back to this certain chapter. I'm going to, you know, practice this chapter for a week. And um, I, I wanted you to feel that way while you, while you read it. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I, um, I have has to do with, first of all, how I see your book in its presentation as art and as a, and a participation in the black aesthetic that um, is not the same way aesthetics is offered in the Western canon. Mm -hmm. That this is a way of thinking that expands us. And so with that, thinking about how we're in a Western society, how do you balance the, what you are thinking with um, the aesthetics of beauty and black culture and the intersections with others that are uh, not um, uh, acculturated in the black um, aesthetic. How do you balance this reparative narrative that we're in with your book um, with that of which has been the blame game and the kind of paranoia that many people must feel when they that when they reckon with the impact of slavery, when they're coming to um, to be honest, as you put forth in the book, the, the honest uh, grip of what is is there facing you, mm -hmm. yet you want to heal and repair, um, which was part of some of the answer you just gave, but how do you see um, the expansion of that aesthetic uh, across our future in this century? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think about culture a lot and I keep, think about aesthetics a lot. Um, and we have seen white supremacy aestheticize itself, yes. patriarchy, um, capitalism, uh, the culture we live in is truly a culture that has been uh, indoctrinated by police and prisons, uh, it's a culture of punishment. Um, uh, and I am, I'm really, um, I'm really, you know, interested in abolition as a cultural project, not just a political project. I believe that abolition is, offers us uh, new ways to implement uh, what we want to see in the world. Um, I'm very interested in how we um, take care of each other and that that is part of an abolitionist framework and, and sharing that care. There's a reason why, you know, a lot of Black people in particular have really challenged, you know, trauma porn, like the showing of Black people, black people dying all the time, a death of Black people. That is, you know, truly the, the psychosis of this country, this obsession with Black death. What about Black life? 
What about black people thriving and being alive and breathing and loving and joy? Um, that to me is, is building out an abolitionist culture and aesthetic as well. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in that. It's why you know, I'm doing work uh, and storytelling with Warner Brothers and building out um, scripted and unscripted work to really fill out to a much larger audience how we care for each other. Um, you know, there's a reason why Black women um, offline, so in the real space, have some of the highest forms of violence against us and our bodies. It's also a reason why online, we're the most, the top most harassed group on social media and on the internet. We're easy targets and very rarely protected. Abolition calls for protecting us, for protecting Black women online and offline. And so I want to be able to create a culture around that. We often don't even realize that we're not protecting Black women, that we're continuing um, the, the hate and the harm against Black women. And so I want to really challenge that. Wonderful. One of our uh, listeners and uh, viewers today has asked if you can uh, give an example of how we can incorporate what you are um, um, theorizing as a practice in our daily lives. And I think you've answered some of that, but maybe there is a space in the book that you could uh, point to that would give us much more um, embrace uh, and understanding of this as daily practice. Is there something that comes to mind for you? Yeah. So when when you purchase the book and you see the the way it's laid out it really offers you know this book can be used as like a daily journal practice i have a set of questions at the end of each chapter that you can answer and i really encourage folks to read it in community read this book alongside your family your friends your staff your loved ones because it's a book that you need to like be engaging with someone like, oh, wait, did you see that question here? Like, how are you thinking about that or that chapter? So I really encourage folks to try to practice this book in community, practice with this book inside of community and use those questions as questions that come back to you and build your own questions, build your own set of questions as well. Okay, well, we have quite a few uh, <laughs> questions from the audience and I do want to uh, honor what they are asking. Um, but before we do that, are there, is there another excerpt from the book that is brief that we can hear your voice once again, read your words? <laughs> sure. Um, let me go to the imagination chapter. Um, like, hold on, let me just look at the table of contacts. I'm flipping through it like the Bible. One second. <laughs> 85. Okay. Say yes to imagination. Science fiction is simply a way to practice the future together. I suspect that it, I suspect that is what many of you are up to. Practicing futures together, practicing justice together, living into new stories. It is our right and responsibility to create a new world. Adrian Marie Brown, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. As a child, I usually walked home from school. Today, many, as a child, I usually walked home from school. Today, many children no longer walk back and forth to school or anywhere else in our communities for safety reasons and otherwise. On one hand, walking was good for me physically and as a way to wind down from the day at school and have my own private thoughts. The thing about walking from school in a neighborhood like mine was, that I literally felt like I was under siege. Police were omnipresent. At police were the omnipresent feature. As I made my way home and across into mostly black and brown working class neighborhood, my body would tense up and my stomach would be in knots. The police were incredibly unpredictable and their presence never made me feel secure or safe. Each block they roamed felt tense, like our communities were being hunted. Sometimes I would wonder, had I done something wrong? Were they on their way to my house? Would I see more officers once I got closer to home? Once I got, once I got to my house, I would finish up my schoolwork and my mom would let us watch 30 minutes of television a day before we would head off to bed. I was a child. Even though we didn't have much in the way of material things, I would have had room to breathe and fall asleep 
I should have had room to breathe and fall asleep and dream. I should not have felt a tightening in my chest because my neighborhood was always surrounded. The flash of blue and red lights streaming into my bedroom all night should not have been my nightlight. With the sounds of sirens all around me instead of falling asleep, I would spend hours gazing at my ceiling, imagining the kind of place where I wished my family and community could live. I didn't imagine luxury. I didn't imagine butlers and swimming pools and fancy clothes. I didn't imagine white gloves and tea length dresses. I didn't imagine servants and my mother doing nothing and still having money. I couldn't imagine that broadly. I simply imagined the things that would allow my mother to be fully joyful. She spent much of her motherhood working three jobs and fighting off the state from swallowing her children alive. I know she was exhausted by the consistent police harassment and attacks on my siblings, my brother Monty in particular. I would imagine a world where our family received food on a regular basis, access to green space and after school activities and programming where my mom could spend time with us instead of having to commit herself to 18 hour workdays. I wanted my family and community to live in a neighborhood not riddled by police and I wanted to be able to get help and support and resources for my community and my community's dreams. I wanted my community to have access to beauty and food and adequate public education. I wanted to know what what I wanted to know that we were not going to just survive but that that but that my community would thrive. All right. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for your, in, your engaging way of delivering uh, the answers to our questions and for sharing with us this magnificent book that gives us a way of thinking that has now engendered so many questions from the audience that would like to honor some of those questions. Um, one from Judy Bigby is when you refer to us feeling held, learning a new way, trying something different. Who do you mean? I ask because there is so much backlash from them, uh, quote, on the process of learning, denouncing lies, trying new things toward the quest for equal, uh, for equal representation and power. That was from Judy Bigby. Yeah. Um, when I say us, I mean people who are interested in healing, transformation, and justice. I mean people who are interested in creating a world that is um, that is treating all of us. Uh, and when I mean all of us, I mean all human beings with care and dignity. Uh, that's who I'm referring to the us. And yes, backlash, unfortunately, is normal. It's sad, it's painful, especially uh, I've been at the, at the brunt of the backlash in these last couple of years, but it's part of the course. And much of our work is to keep reminding people to imagine a world where we don't live in a in backlash, where we don't get criticized and, and, and denounced because of the work that we're trying to do. I, I truly believe this book is a book that I'm trying, I, I brought into the world so folks can feel more seen and loved and cared for so that you can read this and feel like there is hope. You know, I read, I read one of the questions where folks are feeling a lot of hopelessness after the, uh, the 2020 uprisings and seeing the lack of pro progress from electeds and things like that. It's true. It's a really hard, hard time right now, um, which is why I started off with just sending all my love to people. This is not an easy time in history. In fact, it's one of the most difficult times, I, I believe, outside of uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s. But we get to choose something different. Um, we get to uplift uh, uh, the works of so many people who is about who are, are working to transform this system. Uh, you get to show up differently um, and, and remind yourselves of what's possible. Um, I remember a time where you couldn't use the word abolition and now I'm talking about abolition on a book tour with people who are here listening and being present for this conversation. There's so many other abolitionists who are um, being talked about and their work is being shared. And I think that's really important. Okay. Now, one of our viewers is asking, can you help me understand the connection between white supremacy, 
capitalism, the patriarchy, and the incarceration system? This is a very long, it's not a long question, but it is a very heavy question in terms of what they're asking. So um, please feel free to uh, take parts of it if you like. Yeah, so yeah, and I would encourage um, Katie who asked this question yes. to definitely do deep dives as well. Um, you know, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy, that kind of phrase really coined by Bell Hooks. So if you haven't read Bell Hooks, I would encourage you to read her work. She, she really um, helps us dig deep into what that phrase really means. But you can't have um, capitalism without white supremacy. You can't have white supremacy without patriarchy. Um, another way to talk about white supremacy, patriarchy and capitalism is calling it racial capitalism. Um, and uh, the uh, onset of racial, racial capitalism really does come with the onset of chattel slavery. And the work to abolish chattel slavery uh, worked but uh, the 13th Amendment shows us that while chattel slavery was abolished, uh, the system of slavery wasn't abolished because you can read the 13th Amendment, it says slavery will be abolished except if you have been convicted of a crime. And so we are still living in a, slave, a, a slavery system. Um, we are still living in a system that uh, relies on the vestiges of slavery. And that system is incarceration, uh, and that incarcer car and that carceral system is held up by white supremacy and patriarchy. Okay. Um, well, we have a uh, a comment from Priscilla Douglas here. Thank you, Patrice, for inviting us to be abolitionists. Thank you for your courageous brilliance and for making it clear that care and compassion are the underpinning of creating a world that lifts up our humanity. Imagine, life is not fixed. <laughs> I love that, thank you Priscilla. <laughs> I thought that was very generous and, and, and wonderful to, to put into words what many of us are feeling. And, and thank you for Priscilla for that. When, when we want to honor um, more of the questions, we don't have much time left, but I would like to ask some of the people who uh, asked the question of some of the people who sent in their questions even before the session was happening. Um, one of them is, do you have any advice for history teachers like myself who are trying to change the way that we and our students think? You know, um, I love reading lists. Uh, I wouldn't just put my books on reading lists, um, but I'd also put books by Angela Davis and Ruthie Gilmore and uh, Derricka Purnell and Mariam Kaba, all uh, Black women abolitionists who have been changing the very construct of how we understand this uh, system of incarceration. And um, uh, I would, you know, uh, encourage, um, encourage you to talk to your students openly about these really powerful um, systems that are at play in their lives and how they impact them and what alternatives are. Um, abolition was taught to me as an alternative to our current system. And I took to it. I was 18 years old when I took my first abolitionist, well, maybe I was 21 years old. When I took my first abolitionist workshop and it changed the course of my life. Uh, and so don't be afraid to share these kinds of teachings with your students. Um, we have another question is, how do we get white people who don't even understand their own implicit biases to care about reparations? Um, I don't know if you do. <laughs> um, I don't know if the goal is to get people who don't care about reparations or implicit biases to care about them. I think the goal is to organize. Um, we have to remember that uh, oftentimes in history, we don't make change because millions of people make the change, we make change because small groups of people say it's important, it's necessary, and then it helps transform the conditions for millions of people. Okay, 
Thank you for that. Um, as we, we move on into the last part of our program, as we're about to conclude, I do want to ask um, one more question. We have about three minutes left for the questions. Um, it is, how can I, a white female, help to be best supportive and an ally to black people? Um, there's so many ways. Um, keep learning in your own process. I'm a big fan of white folks joining different um, anti-racist white organizations and groups. If you have a local surge chapter in your community, join it. Um, and that can really help you uh, chart your way towards healing, your way towards undoing racism inside of yourself, but also in the world. Well, um, in closing, I'd like to offer uh, the words that were sent to us about how you are charting what I call a new plan, a, a way of looking at how everyday activists can effectively fight for an abolitionist present and future. And in your, your quote from Adrian Brown, that this, this science fiction is only showing us how to practice and, 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 and move in a way that is kin to what we have experienced as we look at, as we look back at 1984 and the Big Brother and, and as all of those kinds of um, paradigms that are advanced by what is called fantasy and science fiction that we can really contribute to our future in ways that are innovative. Um, but when you talk about this reimagining and what reparations looks like for us, that there is this offer of bold love and compassion that um, you lead us to think about that. And uh, in Boston, there's a man who has been an abolitionist. His, his, his life is an abolitionist, is uh, lifted by what he says, his name is Mel King. He says, love is the question and the answer. And what was really pointed in your book was this idea of love and compassion. And so I would just like to uplift that we thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. That there is indeed uh, a need for that more now than ever to look at you know, how we can repair rather than be punitive and work in our own groups uh, to do such. But I would just like to, at this time, lift up your book. People, go get it. Try it in bookstore. You might even get a signed copy. You just really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we want to promote the kind of thinking that Patrice Colors has brought us in this book. And I just wanna say, Patrice, is there any last thought that you'd like to share with us uh, at this time? Just to be kind to each other, um, to love on each other, to take care of each other, to care for each other, and um, to challenge all the ways that this current system is trying to hurt, harm, abuse, lie, um, and, 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 and um, impact the very people who are trying to change the system. Well, thank you so much. And our apologies to those of you who've raised questions that we have not the time right now to answer, but we will copy these questions and hopefully get some answers to you. Uh, and thank you for this brave audience for listening to New Thought, to Critical Think through our situation here together. Uh, on behalf of the Museum of African American History and the Boston Public Library, we want to thank you, Patrice, thank for you so much. Your, your work, not only today, but as you have advanced your career in activism and shown us a, a shining example of the heart of someone who is dedicated to humanity and its betterment. So we want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, if we, the, the slides will be shared for our ending. 
and want to say that the Museum of African American History invites you to join us at uh, 46 Joy Street. We have right now uh, for Black History Month, as we, we know that Black History Month happens three, it not is just the month of February, but that Black History happens throughout the year, 365 days a year. And we want to call to your attention that we have on Thursday, February the 3rd, February the 10th, and February the 17th, film screenings uh, of a film production called Jubilee Juneteenth and the 13th. And there will be uh, it, it will be a lunch and learn session with two of our resident historians, uh, Kelly Carter Jackson and Carrie, Dr. Carrie v Greenwich. The museum is ongoing in its presentation of African American history, its intersection with other cultures and indigenous people. And you can find out about our events at www.mah.org. And so I wanna say thank you for this evening that we will have a also featured at the museum, a special limited time exhibit from February 4th through the 24th uh, called Unresolve, which will uh, highlight the civil rights era, some of the, uh, what has happened in terms of the area, that era and the treatment of people racist murders and out of what has come the shadow of the past. Say their names, know their stories. We have been with a, um, an ardent storyteller tonight. We know that stories can teach us a lot. So visit us at the Museum of African-American History and see this new exhibit. We thank you and hope that you will visit us. And I will now turn it over to, to Kirsten, who will tell you, Kristen, who will tell you more about the Boston Public Library. Thank you very much, Lamerchi. Thank you very much, Patrice, for that conversation and for sharing your work. Before we close for the evening, just a reminder about buying your copy of tonight's featured book, An Abolitionist Handbook, 12 Steps. You can, part, you can purchase your copy and one might be signed from our bookstore partner at Trident. Um, the information is in the chat. And if you use the coupon code BPLSHIP, they will ship nationwide for free via media mail. For upcoming Boston Public Library programs like this one, um, we have highlighted a few here for you, and you can also find out many more. We have programs for all ages at bpl.org. This Wednesday, Philonis Floyd will be in conversation with Boston Public Library President David Leonard, and that'll be at 6 p.m. via Zoom, and you can sign up online. On March 29th, we'll have a revisioning history author panel with three authors from Beacon Press, which is a local publishing house here in Boston, and you can also sign up for that very exciting conversation um, also online. So thank you very much for joining us. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, thank you to Patrice Cullors, thank you to Lamerchi Frazier and to the Museum of African American History. Take care, we hope to see you soon. Good night.